Well, hello and welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. Here we are on the 25th of October. Halloween is just around the corner. And we're going to have yet another jam-packed, action-filled information overload just for you. As a matter of fact, uh, we've got a lot of short clips today. And uh, Dallas, my producer, even said, I don't think we've ever had this many. I think we might have had around this level once before, but I'm not quite sure, and I'm not going to go back and look in the records. Uh, in breaking news, it looks like Rocco Baldelli has been named the manager of the Minnesota Twins. I am going to be honest and say I have absolutely no clues to who he is other than for one little bit in his career he played for the Tampa Bay Rays. That's all I know. I have absolutely no expectations out of him whatsoever. Uh, but welcome to Minnesota, Rocco. Good luck with the Twins. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how things progress. I wish you all the best. So now I get some homework to do because I have, like I say, in, in this case I'm clueless. I did not see this one coming. Anyhow, uh, we are only, what, 12 days away from the 2018 midterm elections, and that's pretty much what we're going to be focusing on today. We're going to start with our Prager University segment, and because health care is the number one talked about issue in politics today, pay attention, because this is what's wrong with government-run health care. It's very easy for a politician to stand up before voters and say, health care is a right, and then passionately advocate for single payer or free health care or Medicare for all, whatever term they might use. But before we consider the merits of the government managing your health care, and that's what this all boils down to, maybe we should ask a more basic question. What do we mean by health care? Because if you get sick, and here we're talking major illness or you're in serious pain, you don't just want health care, you want quality health care. And where is your best chance of finding that? The answer is right here in America. For skilled doctors, cutting edge medical treatments and care without long delays, no other country rivals the United States, not even close. Nobody from Texas is going to Canada for medical treatment. It's almost always the other way around. Sure, our healthcare system has lots of issues, and we should address them. But do we really want to upend all the advantages that we do have and start from scratch? Because that's what would have to happen if we completely turn healthcare over to the government. So let's imagine we make the change. We hear a lot about how great free healthcare would be, but it's only fair we look at the downside. The first is that government-run health care takes medical decisions away from patients, that means you, and puts them in the hands of bureaucrats. They decide, for example, how many MRI machines are going to be available, or under what conditions you can get back surgery, or a bypass, or even whether you qualify for cancer treatment. That's how it works in the United Kingdom, under its single-payer system. Because it has finite resources, the National Health Service, or NHS, sharply restricts access to treatments like hip and knee replacements, cataract surgery, and even prescription drugs to deal with common conditions like arthritis and diabetes. If you suffer from any of these ailments and many others in the UK, you may just have to live with the pain. And let's hope you don't have a medical emergency. In a January 2018 article in the New York Times, patients in emergency rooms around London are described as having to wait 12 hours before they are tended to. Corridors are jammed with beds carrying the frail and elderly. To deal with the situation, hospitals were ordered to postpone non-urgent surgeries until the end of the month. That hardly seems like an improvement over what we have in the U.S. A second big problem with single-payer systems is that they are expensive, really expensive. A recent study by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University found that a Bernie Sanders-style Medicare for All Health system would cost a tidy $32.6 trillion over 10 years. That's on top of what the federal government spends on health care today. And this is not a new number. Other studies have found the cost to be roughly in the same range. So how would we pay for it? Kenneth Thorpe, a professor at Emory University and health policy official in the Clinton administration, spells it out. If you are going to go in this direction, Medicare for all, the tax increases are going to be enormous. Not just for the rich, Thorpe estimates, but for working Americans and the poor, too. Charles Blahaus, the author of the Mercatus study, puts it this way. Even a doubling of all projected individual and corporate income taxes would be insufficient to finance these added federal costs. 
and he considers that a conservative estimate. Canada knows all about exploding health care costs. In Ontario, the country's biggest province, those costs took up 46% of its entire budget in 2010. By 2030, that number is projected to be 80%. In other words, in a few years, Ontario will have little money to pay for anything except health care. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, government-run systems depress the search for new cures. Biomedical research spending in the U.S. far outpaces that of any country with nationalized health care, even when you account for differences in population or size of economies. That's one reason medical breakthroughs rarely come from countries where the government controls health care. They come from the United States, where the government doesn't. The lion's share of biomedical research and development spending in the U.S., over $70 billion in 2012, comes from the private sector. Discovering new medical cures and technology is a profitable business, and thank goodness it is. Those profits drive innovation. Take away the profits, and you will surely take away the innovation. Single payer, free health care, Medicare for all, they might sound great, but like all visions of utopia, they ultimately produce a lot more harm than good. I'm Lan He Chen, fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford for Prager University. Now consider this for just a moment. I, during that video, I took a quick look at uh, Rocco Baldelli's um, resume, I mean his Wikipedia entry. Interesting thing. He was sidelined as a player because of mitochondrial channelopathy. It is a uh, rare cell disorder that affects ions and neurological pathways and causes severe muscle fatigue and can be life-threatening. Uh, but Baldelli was diagnosed with a moderate form, which can be managed with medication and diet. Now, can you just imagine what it would be like if we didn't have research and development money going into healthcare and pharmaceuticals? If we had to live under, you know, uh, Germany or the UK or even Canadian type of healthcare system, Rocco Baldelli could be dead by now if we had to live this way for the last 20, 30 years with no R&D into that. And yet he's now going to be the manager of the Minnesota Twins, and it's because they've been able to study this. That is one of the best things about American medicine. Yeah, and, I'm, and, I, and I say American medicine because we're in this country and it's the politicians who keep making issues uh, where there are none or uh, it, making issues, well, yeah, making issues where there are none, including, you know, regulations that increase the cost of health, health insurance. So the governmental impact on the medical system can help or hurt. And a lot of times it hurts. It, stay, it keeps private developers away, private enterprise, away from actually developing more treatments and more research into things like mitochondrial channelopathy. That's one of the reasons I don't want to go to a single-payer system. I don't want to have a system like Canada or Germany or the UK or Sweden. And hey, I'm half Finnish. I don't even want the Finnish system of health care. I love what we have in America. We are able to do so much and help so many people. Now, are there reforms that are necessary? Of course there are. And I think it would be foolhardy for anybody to say, no, we don't need any reform whatsoever. There are definitely problems with the health insurance and the health care industry that need to be fixed and addressed. But I also think that some of the proposed fixes are going to do long-term harm. And we can't let that happen. Anyhow, that's going to transition me right into our election coverage. Now, yes, I know we have 12 days before the next election. And because of uh, unforeseen things and scheduling, we're actually going to be taping next week's episode today. And so that means as things progress in the campaign, uh, I'm not going to be able to do the prog uh, the, my predictions for the midterms uh, next week, so I'll be doing them today. And with that, what we're going to take a look at is the congressional races first. And what we're going to do, uh, I, I do have a natural order of things, trying to be fair to both, both political parties here, that we've got a series of 
campaign ads. Oh yes, I know, it's those dreaded campaign ads. I've heard so many of them. I can't wait till it's all done, make it stop. But here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do a head to head. We're gonna show you um, first the Democrat, then the Republican for each of these offices. It's gonna be Democrat first, Republican second. And I, I just kind of did a flip of the coin. Who gets first? And in this case, it was Dan Fian, the uh, congressional candidate in the first district. So we're going to uh, show you Dan Fian's, and then we're going to show you uh, Jim Hagedorn's uh, in the first district. And then I'm going to give you a little bit of my commentary and what I think the election is going to turn out to be. Then we'll move on to the next race. Um, so Dallas, would you want to play these back to back, or do you want to just uh, come back to me? Okay, we're going to do them back to back. Okay, so we'll bring up the first two. We're going to have Dan Fian and Jim Hagedorn. And before we before we play this, uh, I am going to make mention here that of which ads did I choose? What I tried to do. I couldn't do this in all races just based upon the information available. I tried to get the, each candidate's last thirty second ad. Uh, some of them I had to just go back. A little bit further than that but for most of these these are the most recent ads that have hit um, I'm just trying to keep as fair as I possibly can here to candidates from both sides of the aisle so let's go ahead and play the first congressional district I served in the Army for approximately 32 years. I'm a proud Minnesotan, just like Dan Fian. Dan Fian and I both served in Iraq with honor. When I see people like Jim Hagedorn, career politician who has not served, attacking Dan Fian, if he's going to attack anybody for doing what they think is right for their country, for their troops, that just pisses me off. Jim Hagedorn should be completely ashamed of himself. That's extremely unpatriotic, un-American, and it's unconscionable. I'm Dan Fian, and I approve this message. I'm Jim Hagedorn, and I approve this message. Dan Fian and Nancy Pelosi, two sides of a very liberal coin. Fian supports letting illegal immigrants take our Medicare dollars. Pelosi, she's for it too. Fian's Medicare scheme would end Medicare as we know it, leading to a $32 trillion government takeover of our health care system, even threatening care at the Mayo Clinic. And Pelosi's for that too. With Dan Fian and Nancy Pelosi, that's a coin toss you lose either way. I'm Angie Craig. Okay, so there we are. Uh, first congressional district. Now, I will be completely honest. I have absolutely no idea who Dan Fian is, and I do not have any idea what he really stands for. I don't live in the first district. Uh, really, with a lot of the uh, non-metro candidates, I really don't know a lot about a lot of them. And the ad really tells me nothing other than, okay, he's a fellow veteran. Okay, great. Um, but having looked at numbers and past election cycles, I'll tell you this. Uh, and I'm going to tell you this for every single, every single race, uh, at least for the congressional. Uh, I've gone through the previous election returns. Now, here, here's the dirty little secret. And if you're a campaign manager, take notes. I don't care if you're Republican, Democrat, whoever. Take notes. I'm going to teach you something right now. The numbers don't change much. What, what do I mean by that? Now let me explain. In every single given precinct, and I think there's like 4,113 precincts in the state, there's a couple of ways you can look at it. So the first way is by what the average of the last three congressional races is. So in Precinct X, you can get, say, 45.16. Precinct Y, you can get 62.57. Precinct Z, you can get 32.22. But you're going to find that the entire ticket for the Republicans and the entire ticket for the Democrats is going to be in a very, very small, narrow band. And it happens that way every election cycle. We rarely, if ever, see a situation where you'll have one candidate at the top of the ticket it's sitting around 65 percent and then another candidate on the same ticket for a different race sitting down there around 25 percent those numbers don't change that much so people show up they vote in blocks now i've always looked at this election cycle since the 2016 election as a status quo election 
and what I thought was going to happen, and it has happened so far, is I thought your Democrat was the Democrat base is going to be highly motivated, and the Republican base is going to be highly motivated, and the independents are probably not as motivated. And so what do you have? Every single midterm election, the non-presidential year, even numbered year election, we have the same type of turnout every midterm. It doesn't matter who the candidates are at the top of the ticket. It doesn't even matter the fact that we have two Senate races. What matters is the people are still going to vote along those same blocks, which means that we can probably expect voter turnout statewide to be somewhere around the mid-60s, 63 to 67 percent. That's going to be that range that we have for turnout. It's not going to be up in the 70s. That's a presidential type of turnout. It's not going to be that high. It never is. It's a midterm. At the same time, it's not going to be below 50. It's probably not even going to be below 60. It is going to go according to the historical norms that for the turnout, and regardless of what the results are going to be, the fact is the number of people voting as a percentage of registered voters is going to be somewhere around 65%. Give or take, there is a margin of error. It's not an exact science because people still have to show up and vote. But if you go back the last 20, 30, even 40 years, you're going to find that statistically we're in the mid-60s on midterm elections. Every single midterm. And so if you take a look at that, and then you take a look at what the Republicans and Democrats poll in each precinct, you can actually extrapolate a pretty accurate prediction of what we should be seeing for a vote in two weeks. That being said, I have actually calculated. I just took one set of numbers. I just grabbed the Republican numbers. In the first congressional district, the Republican, assuming that everything stays according to historical norms, gets 45.57% of the vote. If Jim Hagedorn did absolutely nothing, he could expect to get around 45.57% or of the vote. I didn't even bother calculating the Democrats this time around just because I was in a rush to do this. So that gives you a baseline that Hagedorn should see somewhere around 457 now, what I don't know, of course, is the, the uh, lay of the land of the 1st District, southern Minnesota, uh, and I don't know what the two candidates are doing. The Democrats, because you still have third-party candidates and write-ins, you can expect that that's going to be around the same, probably because Tim Walls was the, the incumbent congressman for so long, that you're probably going to be dealing with about a 46 to 47 percent Democrat turnout which is a very, very, very tight race just out of the starting gate. Then when you take a look at where independents go, that's what happens with the, um, how, how the turnout goes. So first is, of course, securing your base. Then the second is getting any swing voters or ticket splitters on your side and not on your opponent's side. And that's what all these ads are trying to do. If you are undecided as to who you're going to vote for, you're being targeted by any of the candidates in your district that they want you to vote for them. And that's what a campaign is for, to make, their, make, make the case. So looking at historical lenses, it's a very, very close race. Now you take a look at polling, that some of the polling suggests it's within the margin of error. But now there has been a trend in the last two months where the first district race gets rated toss-up, then it goes into the lean Republican category, then it comes back to toss-up, then back to lean Republican, back to toss-up. And because this is Jim Hagedorn's third time running versus Dan Fian's first time, and I don't know what the positive and negatives are down there. Uh, I am going to say that Jim Hagedorn pulls this one out, and my prediction is that Hagedorn wins. Uh, he's got a lot going for him in the makeup of the district, uh, positive or just name identification, and the fact that Dan Fian is still a relatively unknown going into this election cycle. Again, I could be wrong based upon local conditions that I don't know about, but from the uh, analyst viewpoint, um, right now I think it's Hagedorn's to lose. 
Now we're going to move on to the second congressional district with Angie Craig going against incumbent Jason Lewis. I'm Angie Craig, and I'm going town by town, meeting with folks, because Jason Lewis won't. Health insurance is very costly. I don't know how they ever got their hands on Social Security in the first place, but I'm going to work to shore up Medicare and Social Security. Washington is more concerned with large business and large banks and big money. My health care is a lot of money. we got to get back to fighting for Minnesotans. I'm Angie Craig, and I approve this message. Now, on to Shakopee. Political insiders like Angie Craig take my words out of context and tell you I'm a monster. <laughs> They'll do anything to keep power. I'm Jason Lewis. I may not be politically correct, but I won't back down from the tough issues. In Congress, I'll put you before political games and before political parties. Together, we'll turn this economy around, stop the spending, and we'll secure our borders. I'm Jason Lewis, and I approve this message because I'll be an independent voice for Minnesota. Okay, that was a hard-fought campaign two years ago. That one came right down to the wire. This one looks like it's probably going to come right down to the wire. Now, the Cook Political Report does have this listed in the lean Democrat category. The Democrats, the, the Democrat PACs, Angie Craig herself, they've been throwing a lot of money into that race. Here is the numbers. For the Republicans, they get 52.12% which means that Jason Lewis can afford to lose 2.12% of his, of his base voters and still win the election. I am thinking that the Democrats are overdoing it in the 2nd District. It, it's one of those purple districts, but it still kind of leans Republican. John Klein had the district for a long time. Now Jason Lewis has had it for two years. But I think the Democrats in, are so into getting the second district that they're doing the overkill on the ads. And I think that might actually backfire. Uh, it's still a very, very tight race. It, you know, I really think it's rated a toss-up. Uh, at the end of the day, I think Jason Lewis, only because he's got a little bit of a cushion that he can afford to lose, that at the end of the day he might actually pull it out and win. Um, it would not surprise me if Angie Craig ends up winning it, uh, simply because they've spent a lot of money trying to get that seat. But I still think that Jason Lewis has enough going for him that he's going to squeak it out. Um, again, I wouldn't be surprised if it went the other way, however. So that's a look at the second district. And now let's take a look at the third district, which is the uh, other uh, Minneapolis suburban area. What will it take to heal our country? With all the anger and division, my campaign for Congress is built on the belief that people have to start talking again, and no political party has a monopoly on good ideas. I'm Dean Phillips, and I hope you'll join us. Thousands of Democrats, Independents, and Republicans coming together to forge a better way forward, one of decency, respect, and contagious optimism. I approve this message because I know that together we can heal our country. Deceptive Dean says, We do offer health care to full time employees. The truth? Phillips got caught refusing to offer health care at his coffee shop. Here's Phillips in his own words. Asked if he offered insurance, he said, quote, No, we don't. And another company run by Phillips tried to cut nurses' health and pension benefits. Deceptive Dean Phillips. If we can't trust what he says, how can we ever trust him in Washington? Congressional Leadership Fund is responsible for the content of this advertising. Okay, I have to make a disclaimer. I should have made it before the ad. I was unable to find an ad from the Eric Paulson campaign, and so we ended up using the CLF Super PAC ad in place. Uh, I think that was like one of the only ads I was able to actually find. So that was not actually put out by the Paulson campaign, in just a full disclosure. And I will also say that when we actually look at the 7th District race with um, Colin Peterson, there is, I think, American Chemistry Pack. We couldn't find an ad from Colin Peterson, so we substituted with the uh, Chemistry Pack ad as a placeholder. So, again, uh, the ad we just played about Dishonest Dean did not come from Eric Paulson. That came from the CLF Super Pack. 
Now that being said, uh, taking a look at the baseline numbers for the 3rd Congressional District, Eric Paulson for the midterm election should have 58.70%. 58.7%. That is actually a very comfortable cushion for an incumbent in what is often considered a swing district. Can Dean Phillips cut into that? Of course he can. Uh, Cook partisan or the Cook political report rates this a lean Democrat uh, area. But if you're sitting with a 58.7 margin, you get 8.7% of the vote that you can afford to lose and still win. And Eric Paulson, I don't think, has done anything bad per se that would have the average voter turn on him. Of course, you got ads going back and forth, and you've seen all the ads. Um, Dean Phillips, of course, does have a lot of good things going for him. Uh, one is he has money to compete against a longtime incumbent uh, Republican you know, in that suburban district. Um, he doesn't have a name that turns people off. And I say that meaning that if you have a very, very, very long name or hard-to-pronounce name, e not easily recognizable, you know, that's gonna, that can cost you a few points at the polls. Well, Phillips is definitely not one of those names. So, <coughs> excuse me, Dean Phillips has a lot of upside. I don't really know exactly how these ads have been playing, uh, other than the ones that I located online, simply because I've turned the TV set off. The only time I ever really turned the TV set on, other than being here for North Star Oasis, is actually when uh, uh, football games or the World Series are on. That's it. That's the only TV I watch these days. I do everything else on the computer. Sometimes I'll watch TV on the computer, and a lot of times I can get away from some of those ads. So I don't see what they're seeing in the 3rd District. I'm letting you know I don't see that. So there could be something there with Dean Phillips, but I think that 8.7% is a little bit of a tough margin for uh, Dean Phillips to overcome. I just don't think that he is going to be able to overcome what Eric Paulson can afford to lose. So I'm going to rate this one as 3rd uh, District goes back to Eric Paulson. It's not necessarily by Eric Paulson's doing. It's going to be more from the fact that he's in a district that favors him so heavily that even with as much of a, the attacks that he's been getting, that he'll be able to withstand all of that and still come out on top. And I will also have to say that one of the other things uh, that is missing from this complete analysis is I don't know what's going on on the ground. I don't know how much literature has been going to the door. I don't know what kind of the get out the vote phoning and door knocking mechanisms any of these candidates have. So I'm only purely looking at the numbers, the ads, the Cook political report, what they have to say, and then based upon my own knowledge of each congressional district over 30 years of, of uh, campaign experience. So that's where I'm coming from, but if I miss anything, it's going to be a locally conditioned thing. And so I'm still going to go out on a limb and say that Dean Phillips falls short in this. That's probably going to set Dean Phillips up for a rematch in 2020 if, I'm, if my hunch is correct. But I think Eric Paulson weathers this storm, and he serves for another two years, I guess I'll say a conditional two years, uh, in Congress. And with that, we are now going to move on to the 4th Congressional District, which I know is the race that you are paying probably the closest attention to, because that is where the majority of our viewership is. So we're going to start off with Congresswoman Betty McCollum. What do you think of President Trump's erratic behavior and reckless tweets? Too often it's alarming and disgraceful. Republicans control Congress, but they refuse to put any checks on this president. They'd rather protect him. Congress needs the courage to do its job, to stop the corruption and profiteering infecting this White House. I'm Betty McCollum, and I approve this message because with your vote, you can help me hold President Trump accountable. So there is the ad from Congresswoman Betty McCollum, and I forgot to mention her opponent, so that's why I had, uh, I had um, Dallas cut back to me. 
So Congresswoman Betty McCollum, she was first elected to the Congress in the year 2000. She is running against Greg Ryan. And Greg was the 4th Congressional District candidate two years ago. He is running again. And he uh, came out with an ad this week. Here is his ad. Domestic violence claimed 24 lives in Minnesota in 2017. Now, Democratic leaders are calling for an investigation into domestic violence allegations against Representative Keith Ellison, allegations corroborated by witnesses and medical records. His accuser says she's been smeared, threatened, isolated after naming him as her attacker. The police won't investigate, but Representative Betty McCollum stands with Ellison, campaigning with him as he seeks to become Attorney General, the state's highest law enforcement position. Call Betty McCollum. Ask her why she won't hold men like Keith Ellison accountable for how they treat women. My name is Greg Ryan, and I approve this message. Okay, here's the thing. The 4th District... Notice that neither of those candidates were sp speaking about what they were for. Uh, neither of them were really focused on the other candidate. Betty McCollum was not talking about, was not campaigning against Greg Ryan. She was campaigning against Donald Trump. Greg Ryan was not campaigning against Betty McCollum, although, you know, they do have the, the little bit at the end regarding Betty standing with Keith Ellison. Uh, but Greg Ryan is campaigning against Keith Ellison. What are they doing? Here's the answer. The district has only 32.54% Republicans on average. Greg Ryan, I think, kind of knows he's probably going to lose. So instead of, oh, and, and Betty McCollum probably knows that she's going to win. So instead of looking at each other, they're both grounded in reality enough to know that what they're trying to do is benefit the top of the ticket. And so those ads are both based upon turnout. I think Betty McCollum is trying to get independents and uh, Democrats on board to vote for the Democrat ticket. I think Greg Ryan is trying to use uh, Keith Ellison as a way of rallying the Republican ticket uh, for Republicans and for uh, independents. That's what those two are doing with those ads. For both of them, I have to say it's a brilliant strategy. I mean, when you see the results staring you in the eye, might as well take whatever resources you have and try to better the ticket for your party. I mean, that's not a bad strategy. And both of them are employing it this time. So I have to commend both of them in that regard. Um, as a shady politician, that they're both doing the things that their party needs them to do in order to win the midterms statewide. And so that's what we have happening there. Uh, I'm going to move on to the 5th District. We do not have any ads from the 5th District. I don't even know if they're running ads. Uh, Jennifer Zielinski is the Republican going against Ilian uh, Omar. Um, it's 23.5% Republican. It's like 70-something percent Democrat. Omar is going to win. That's pretty much a predetermined outcome. Neither of them are really doing anything uh, as far as TV exposure. And so there's really not a whole lot more of analysis that I can give you other than stating the obvious, that the Democrats will hold on to the 5th District seat. Uh, as Keith Ellison now runs for Attorney General. So we're going to skip ahead now to the 6th District, and this is Ian Todd versus Tom Emmer. My name's Ian Todd, and I'm a millennial running for Minnesota's 6th Congressional District. I'm running because I have never lived in a world in which politics was not about division. I have never lived in a world in which politics was filled with fear and hate. I have never lived in a world in which politics is actually about the people being represented. I believe we can change all of that. I believe that politics not only can be about the people, but that it has to be. I believe that we can shift the balance of power back to the people, that we can stand up to the wealthy few who have rigged the system in their favor, and we can reconnect with our neighbors and restore our sense of community. My name is Ian Todd, and I am asking for your vote in November. I'm Ian Todd. 
and I approve this message. I'm Tom Emmer. Nearly half the counties in the U.S. don't have access to even basic mental health service. And those communities are among the hardest hit by suicide and opiate addiction. So I wrote a bill funding mental health resources for underserved communities. And I voted to improve recovery treatment and take concrete steps toward helping prevent addiction. I'm Tom Emmer, and I approve this message because working together, we can help those in need get the care they need. So kind of like the 4th and 5th districts, the 6th district is also pretty much predetermined outcome. Uh, Tom Emmer has a 57.37% base to work from. So Tom Emmer most likely will end up being reelected into Congress. I kind of think everybody knows that. And that's why millennial Ian Todd is running for Congress because he is the 6th district sacrificial lamb. He does not stand too much of a chance at getting elected. Uh, Ian Todd, of course, he's probably got some other political ambitions. This is a way for him to get some exposure, get his name out there. He might reap some benefits somewhere down the road, whether it's a state house or state senate bid, or uh, if Tim Walls becomes governor, maybe there's going to be a gubernatorial appointment in store for him. Uh, I'm sure Ian Todd will get something out of it. I give it a very high likelihood that he will not be going to Washington to serve in Congress. Uh, this is not the district that it was when Michelle Bachman was in Congress, when the very name Michelle Bachman would utter a million dollar contribution, a million dollars worth of contribution from people across the country into her opponent's campaign. And that's literally what was happening. Michelle Bachman could have you know, the, the numbers were there, like in the first district and even the second district, uh, third district. The numbers were there in favor of Michelle Bachman. She was a sixth district congresswoman. And then she would open her mouth, say something that would inflame the uh, Democrats, and they would just spend money like you wouldn't believe on a big money bomb, funnel up uh, a lot of buying power for her opponent, and then she's staving off a last-minute challenge. Tom Emmer is a lot more crafty in what he says and what he does than what Michelle Bachman was. And that's what, one of the reasons why Tom Emmer has such a solid base to work from in the 6th Congressional District. So Emmer is going to get reelected. Ian Todd will get some sort of position payoff somewhere down the road for being the Democrat's sacrificial lamb. But he, I think, is even a realist. Otherwise, you would have seen a more professional quality ad, ad out of him. But you know, him standing up in a boat pretty much with a uh, cell phone camera, that's really not that much of an ad. I think even Ian Todd knows it. But you got to give the guy some credit for at least running a, uh, a campaign, probably on a shoestring budget without a whole lot uh, of support behind him. So hats off to Ian Todd for the challenge, but Tom Emmer is still going to win the election. Now we are going to move on to one of the other congressional battlegrounds. Now notice we've had three of them so far. First congressional district is a battleground uh, district. Second, third district, those are battlegrounds. And now we're in the fourth battleground uh, district out of eight congressional districts. And that features Dave Hughes challenging 30-year or 28-year incumbent Democrat Colin Peterson. Uh, this is the other pack ad that we are using because I do not have an ad from Colin Peterson, and then I do have one from Dave Hughes. So let's take a look at the ads. In Washington, both sides argue, each promoting their own agenda, not Colin Peterson. Colin was named the single most independent member of Congress in either party because he votes with the Republicans when they're right and the Democrats when they're right, always putting the people of western Minnesota first. You see, Colin's a true constitutionalist, a congressman who puts people ahead of party, whose only agenda is helping you. Congressman Colin Peterson, America's most independent member of Congress. I'm Colin Peterson and I approve this ad. I'm Dave Hughes. I've spent my life defending our freedoms. Every day, I pilot drones to patrol and secure our borders. I'm a combat veteran who served over 20 years in the Air Force. As a conservative, I'll stand with our president, secure our borders, repeal Obamacare, lower taxes, promote agriculture, and keep America great. Let's change Washington. I'm Dave Hughes, and I approve this message. 
okay, I guess I stand corrected. We did have a Colin Peterson ad. So I'm glad to see that I was able to find one. I, for some reason, I wrote it down wrong. Uh, the error on that case is mine. Nonetheless, this is a 42.57% Republican district. It is another battleground. It is close. The question is, does Dave Hughes have enough to overpower Colin Peterson? I don't think so. I think that the Democrat drop-off in 2016, when Trump was able to win that area by overwhelming margins and bring Hughes to the cusp, I think that excited them a little bit up in the eighth and the seventh district, but I also think that that two years ago was the opportunity to take out Colin Peterson, and they fell short. I think Colin Peterson is a little worried this time around. That's why we see an ad from him. Um, but I also think that between the PACs and Colin Peterson and the Democrats and nationally. They know that they, ha they were going to have a fight on their hands. I think they braced themselves for it. And I'm not necessarily sure that Dave Hughes can overcome that seven, uh, seven and a half point gap. I think that at the end of the day, Colin Peterson will probably go back for yet another term in Congress. Uh, but that, you know, anything's still possible. I just don't see it happening. Uh, good luck to Dave Hughes. Um, I, I still think that Colin Peterson pulls this out. Cook uh, Political Report also has this rated as a lean Democrat uh, district, and I think that they're probably right on, on this one. So that is the 7th Congressional District, and so let's just do a quick recap here. I've got Hagedorn winning the first, Lewis winning the second, Paulson winning the third, McCollum winning the fourth, uh, Omar winning the fifth, Emmer winning the sixth, Peterson winning the seventh. That leads us to the eighth congressional district, which is an open seat, uh, as we have Joe Radinovich, the Democrat, going against Pete Stauber, the Republican. Let's take a look. These guys have one thing in common. They rig the system, get all the profits, and stick us with the bill. They even blocked us from tackling the opioid crisis. I'm Joe Radinovich. In Minnesota, we know it's time we had quality, affordable health care. We can, with Medicare for All. And it starts with getting special interest money out of our government. I'm Joe Radinovich, and I approve this message because it's time we take our country back. Pro hockey player, Duluth police officer. Small business owner. Pete Stauber has worn a lot of uniforms in his life, but no uniform is more important to him than being a dad and a husband. I'm Pete Stauber, and that's why I'm running for Congress, to look out for all Minnesota families. In Washington, I'm not interested in any political party's uniform. I'm interested in getting things done. I'm Pete Stauber, and I approve this message, because for me, northern Minnesota families always come first. Well, our in 2006, neither party spent hardly any money in the 8th Congressional District. In 2016, they spent $25 million combined. Since Chip Kravak knocked off Jim Oberstar in 2010, this has been one of the highly, most sought after, highly contested blood feud fights that we've probably ever seen in politics. There was only one other congressional district that had higher spending than Minnesota's 8th Congressional District. I don't even remember which one. It might have been a district in, like, Virginia. $25 million two years ago. I have no idea what they're spending this year. I, I do not. I have not looked at finance reports. I'll look at all of that stuff probably the first of the year uh, once all of the campaign finance reports are due and the reports start coming out. But if $25 million was spent there in 2016... What do you think the odds of that going in either direction are? Again, in the absence of money, we can take a look at the landscape. We can see what the player, movers and shakers are doing. Cook Political Report has this as lean Republican. The New York, I think New York Times Cinema poll has Stauber leading. The Democrat Congressional Campaign Committee 
pulled out their $1.2 million ad buy. And they're reallocating it to the other four battleground uh, congressional districts in the state. I think that should be a telltale sign that Pete Stauber will be the next congressman from the 8th Congressional District. Uh, how this fares in 2020 is going to be anybody's guess. But I think if Pete wins by an overwhelming margin and Donald Trump won there by, I think, 16 points in 2016, I don't think in 2020 that the Democrats will and Republicans will fight quite as aggressively over that territory. The Stauber name is well known in the Duluth area and throughout St. Louis County, which is actually where the, probably the weakest area of the entire congressional district for Republicans, and that happens to be a position of strength for the Stauber family. Rodinovich is also well known in the 8th congressional district, so that kind of offsets things a little bit. But I think the way that this campaign is going this year, it's going to be Pete Stauber's. Now the question for Joe Radinovich is going to be whether or not he will go through for a re-election in 2020 or whether it's just going to call it quits after this. We'll, we'll find out sometime next year. But I do really strongly think that um, oh, the uh, numbers in this district are 47.19% for Republicans. Uh, this is no longer Jim Oberstar's congressional district. And so I think that having the Stauber name in Duluth, having Donald Trump campaign up there early, uh, a few months ago, in, in June actually, uh, I think everything has Pete Stauber's name written on this, but he's going to be kind of like Jim Oberstar. It's not just for now. I think this is going to be Pete Stauber's well into the future. Uh, we're going to move on right now. Uh, because I was unable to find ads from uh, Amy Klobuchar, and I don't think that she's running ads, we're going to just play uh, one section, I think from Carol Evan, on uh, their take on this race between the two candidates. The week of election previews wraps up tonight with a look at Minnesota's other race for U.S. Senate. Amy Klobuchar is back on the ballot for the third time, facing a challenge from Republican state lawmaker Jim Newberger. John Croman takes a closer look at the race. Democrat Amy Klobuchar is wrapping up her second term in the U.S. Senate and is asking voters for another six years. She wants to be judged on her ability to cut through the gridlock. She'll point to the new Stillwater Bridge as just one example of a bipartisan deal she helped engineer. People thought that was never going to happen, and we were able to get everyone in the Senate to agree on an exemption to the law that allowed us to uh, build that bridge. Klobuchar first ran for the Senate in 2006 after eight years as Hennepin County Attorney. Part of her work in Washington has been inspired by tragedies, such as Abigail Taylor's death from a pool drain, or veterans sickened by burn pits overseas, or the opioid overdose epidemic. She's also pressured pharmaceutical companies on drug shortages, including the chemotherapy drug that Axel Zerbes, the son of a CARE 11 employee, needed. She's still hoping to get drug pricing reform. That has been the most frustrating thing because I really think pharma thinks that they own Washington but they don't own me. You're asking about yeah, blackout. She made the national spotlight when she asked then Judge Brett Kavanaugh if he'd ever blacked out. Is that your answer? Yeah and I'm curious if you have. I have no drinking problem. Judge, yeah, judge. Yeah, nor do I. But long before that Klobuchar had already said she was voting against his confirmation because of his views on presidential powers and consumer protection. I think he was in a very heated part of the hearing and he kind of shot back at me and then he came back after the break and apologized. People are lining up with it. Republican challenger Jim Newberger of Becker says he's inspired by Paul Wellstone's underdog victory in 1990. Wellstone was outspent six to one, but he had two things going for him. One, he had that fire in his belly, and I've got that fire. And the other thing that he had, he had a message at the time more people agreed with. In the State House, he co-authored the hands-free cell phone bill based in part on his decades as a North Memorial paramedic. I've seen uh, over 30 years the amount of motor vehicle trauma and needless injuries and, and needless senseless death caused by distracted driving. Newberger's also been at many shooting scenes on his job but opposes tougher gun laws. The issue is not about guns. The issue is about what's going on in the human heart. He also wants to suspend refugee resettlement. I want to be very clear, some 
not all, some refugees uh, do not intend to live under American law. They want to live under a different form of law. Now on health care costs, Newberger favors a return to more of a free market model. Klobuchar wants to shore up the Affordable Care Act and find ways to bring insurance prices down. For CARE 11 News, I'm John. Well, in uh, statewide races, the numbers suggest 45.05 should be the minimum for Republicans on the statewide ballot. However, the first requirement to get that is you've got to secure your base, and to secure your base, everybody needs to know who you are. And a month ago, the Star Tribune came out with a poll that showed that only 24% of the respondents knew who Jim Newberger was. So that alone, right there, is going to eat into that, uh, that gap. It's bad enough that you need 4.95% to hit 50%, but if you're not already well known by people, then you have that much more catching up to do. Uh, I think Amy Klobuchar is popular enough that it would not surprise me if, if she wins this race over Jim Newberger by double digits margin. Uh, we had Jim Newberger on the show uh, a few months ago. You can go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash North Star Oasis, if you want to watch that video, if you want to know more about him. But uh, as far as all intents and purposes, I expect that Senator Amy Klobuchar will get another six-year term. Since we're getting close on time, I'm going to keep the rest of my comments short. We're going to go right to the next Senate race for the Al Franken seat. This is Tina Smith versus Karen Housley. As a teacher, I want to see all of my kids succeed. There are careers out there that pay well. They just need the skills to pursue them. Having a teacher with real world experience kind of gave me a leg up. So I think Tina Smith really understands the importance of a better career and technical education. The law she just passed lets more people with real world experience come in and teach in the classroom. I would say that the benefit of having all this experience, I could actually go out and make a career. Tina is getting it done for our kids' future. I'm Tina Smith and I approve this message. Work hard, play fair, and do the right thing. I'm Karen Housley, and those are the values I learned growing up in Minnesota, both in and around the hockey rink. It's how Phil and I raised our family. But in Washington, D.C., career politicians like Tina Smith don't understand our values and just aren't getting anything done. And that's why I'm running to bring Minnesota values and real results to Washington, D.C. I'm Karen Housley, and I approve this message. This is the first of the close statewide races. And it is so close that it's a razor thin margin. I think Tina Smith not showing up the, the, for the Channel 5 debate was a big campaign misstep. I think it was a missed opportunity. And I think that is probably going to be the biggest reason why Karen Housley sneaks out, sneaks out with a narrow victory over Tina Smith. So I think it's going to be Housley by maybe one percentage point. I, I just don't see Housley having a big lead. I don't see uh, Housley losing this one either as it sits right now. Now, um, two weeks from now might be a different story, but as, as it's looking right now, I expect to see Housley win it by one. Uh, now we're going to go to the other major razor-thin margin, which I'm going to even say is probably even... Uh, even a thinner margin, and that is going to be the Tim Walls, Jeff Johnson race for governor. Across Minnesota, people are waking up, getting kids to school, and heading to work. We may not all look the same, but we share some pretty important beliefs that work should pay a living wage, that everyone should have access to health care they can afford, and that every child deserves a great education. I'm Tim Walls and I'm running for governor so that everyone in every community has the chance to succeed because we're one Minnesota. We've seen massive tax hikes in Minnesota, but our roads are still a mess, our schools still say they're broke, and we pay our nursing home workers less than McDonald's. We pamper freeway protesters, ignore welfare fraud, and government can't even issue license tabs. Minnesota is better than this. If you want more of the same, vote for the other guy. I will hold government accountable to taxpayers again and stop wasting your money. I'm Jeff Johnson. I'm going to give you your government back. This race is 50-50. That's the only way I can say it. It is a complete toss-up. I cannot call this race. I am going to call this one so razor thin 
that within the next two weeks we might see a potential winner or we might really see a very, very long election night. I am not going to be pre predicting either of these guys to win. All I know is that one of them is going to lose and the other is not. I just don't know which one it's going to be. Uh, it can be either of them. Uh, they both have the strengths. They both have the weaknesses. But honestly, this is the tightest race that we've probably seen since the Coleman Franken 2008 U.S. Senate race. Uh, that's how close this race is shaping up. Now, we do have one final race to discuss. Of course, I would save the best for last. And that is the Keith Ellison, Doug Wardlow race for Minnesota Attorney General. Each and every person deserves fair protection under the law, no matter one's income, gender, race, faith, who we are, who we love, or where we live. My name is Keith Ellison, and that's why I'm running to serve as your Attorney General. Keith Ellison, extreme out of touch. Extreme Keith Ellison supported cop killers, open borders, and worse yet, Keith Ellison has been accused of domestic violence by multiple women. Even the National Organization for Women has called for Ellison to end his campaign. And now Extreme Keith Ellison wants to be our Attorney General? How can we trust him to look out for us? Doug Wardlow is running for Attorney General to be Minnesota's lawyer. Doug Wardlow will look out for all of us, for every Minnesotan. Vote Doug Wardlow for Attorney General. This is the one race that I think is going to probably surprise people. And when I say surprise people, uh, it's going to be the margin. Because Keith Ellison took a huge win in the DFL primary on primary election night. But I'm going to proclaim that I think that Doug Wardlow is going to win this race by double digits. The last poll that came out said that Wardlow was up by 7. I think he might even be up as high as 12. Uh, the Ellison domestic abuse stuff has not been playing well, especially in light of the Brett Kavanaugh hearings, and voters are paying attention. And that is actually probably the single most factor in why the Republicans are actually having so many competitive races this year. And part of it is because you have Keith Ellison on the ticket, and the Democrats are not distancing themselves from him enough. They haven't called on him to resign. They haven't given him the pressure. And the Republicans have been exploiting that. And I think that's one of the biggest reasons why we're going to see Doug Wardlow as the Attorney General, and you've heard it here first, double-digit win. Again, barring anything happening in the next two weeks. Anyhow, we're going to leave you with a little bit of music from 1840 presidential election. Tip a canoe and Tyler too. 50s. <laughs> <laughs> you look it up on Wikipedia. Woo! <laughs> I just put it in there. <laughs> so here's, uh, here's the song. It's a very uh, uh, excellent song. Best song from 1840 I can think of. <laughs> days before the midterms, 60 days, shopping days left until Christmas. For Dallas Pearson Producer, I'm your host, Jeff Williams. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.